you turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. You know, throughout our lives, we are presented with a huge number of facts and truths and truth claims that we have to consider, that we have to do something with. But not all those truths that we're presented with are of equal value or equal weight. You know, some of those truths are completely irrelevant. Like, so what? Uh, others are interesting, but they don't really affect our lives in any particular way. Others do have a much more significant effect on our lives, and we, uh, we see, they, they affect how we see the world, how we see ourselves. And then there are some truths that are just so monumental that they shape our entire existence. They have the potential to form or to transform our entire worldview. Today, we're going to be dealing with one of those universe-shaping, life-altering sorts of truths. And that truth is that Jesus of Nazareth is God in the flesh. He is. He is the creator of the world who came into the world that he created. And so today we're coming to the, the end of the prologue of John's gospel, which has all been about the fundamental identity of Jesus Christ. John used this prologue of his gospel to introduce Jesus, the one about whom he was writing this entire account. And he gives us a preview of some of the key themes and some of the key concepts that he will then be uh, unpacking in more detail later through the gospel. And so just like last week, uh, last couple of weeks, I'm going to read the entire prologue because I want us to get the whole flow of what he's saying in this. Uh, and then we'll focus in on just on the, the few verses at the end. God's word says this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of natural descent or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, this is the one of whom I said, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son who is himself God, and is at the Father's side. He has revealed him. This is God's word. And what we see in this prologue, and we've been seeing the last couple of weeks, John's gospel begins way further back than any of the others. He shows us that the life and the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the, the climax of a story that began way further ahead of time. It begins here with the word. In the beginning, God created the universe with a spoken word. And at that same time, there was a living word, a person already in existence before creation. He was both with God and he was God. And this word was the source and the origin of all of creation. All that has been made in this universe was made by him and through him. And so just as the spoken word brought light into existence, this living word, as John says, is the light of humanity. 
In other words, he reveals the truth about God. He reveals the truth about God's plan of redemption and his plan of restoration of the world. And when he entered into the world, his arrival was announced. It was announced first by John the Baptist. And although many rejected the good news that John proclaimed, there were some who saw the truth, some who saw the light, who received it. And they received the enormous privilege of becoming God's children. Now, although those of us who believe in Jesus Christ get this amazing privilege of becoming children of God, there is still a huge difference between us and the one who granted this privilege to us. Jesus Christ is the one and only the unique Son of God. And so in this last section of the prologue, John focuses in on that, Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the Word. And he introduces us to the glory of the incarnation. Now, the incarnation was a humbling thing. That, that's what Paul focuses in on, like in the, the other classic passage on the incarnation, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, seven. he says, he emptied himself. In other words, he made himself of no account. He lowered himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of human, humanity. So obviously it is true that it is a humiliation that Jesus would take on flesh, become incarnate. But John here in the beginning of his gospel is focusing on the glory of the incarnation. Because not only was it a humbling thing, it was a glorious thing that Jesus Christ became human flesh. He was God in human flesh. And what he was doing, the, the rescue mission that he was on, is a glorious thing. And, of course, Paul would completely agree with that. He says as much in other passages. But here, John, again, is focusing in on the glorious truth of the incarnation. In these few verses, it's just, he packs so much into these few verses. He highlights, one, the uniqueness of the incarnation, of the Word made flesh. He attests to the glory that was seen by the eyewitnesses, the, John the Baptist and the other apostles. And he tells us some, a little bit, just a preview about some of the effects of the incarnation, what it accomplished. So this is a very dense passage. So, you know, this is, we're going to wade through it. So pull up your waders, and uh, we're going to go through. The first verse of our section highlights, describes the unique and special thing that is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It would not be hard at all to preach an entire sermon just from this verse. In fact, many pastors you might have heard do that on Christmas or Christmas Eve. But it starts out with this phrase that's just so full of meaning. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so once again, we're reminded of the word. Remember, the, the, this is the logos that John introduced in verse 1. Now, he, he hasn't used that title since verse 1. But here he picks that title back up. Because he wants to do that because he wants to make sure that we make the connection back to verse 1. That word. He's talking about that word, that same person, the word who was in the beginning, the word who was with God, who, the, word who, the word who was God, that same word became flesh. That's what he's wanting us to get from this. The word who was God, who is God, that also is the word who is man. He became flesh. That's the incarnation in a nutshell. The enfleshment of God, if you will. God joined with man in one person. The word became flesh. It's really interesting that John used the word flesh in this case because he had other options that he could have used. But this word is probably the crudest or harshest term he could have used. And he used it for a specific reason. I mean, he could have said that, that God took on a physical body, the Greek word soma. He could have said that he took on this physical body. The problem with that would have been, it would not have been entirely accurate only partially true, and it would allow for theological error, so he didn't use that one. Because Jesus didn't just use a human body like an earth suit, the way an astronaut uses a space suit. You know, he wasn't just the divine spirit in a human body, kind of like spirit possession or something. Because Jesus had a full human nature. He had both the physical parts, like the physical body, and the non-physical parts, like the spirit. So he wasn't just God in a body. So that's why 
John didn't use the word body here. John also could have said Jesus became a man. Anthropos is the Greek word. That would have been reasonably accurate. Uh, it wouldn't have introduced any errors, but it would mean approximately the same thing as saying he became flesh. Flesh in this context is the, just as comprehensive a term as man. It refers to the flesh, the bones, the blood, the soul. It refers to the whole human being, material and immaterial parts. But the flesh focuses in on the most material part of a human being, and it seems almost completely opposite to what John said about the word in verse 1. Flesh, as one writer puts it, is the most vulnerable, the most corruptible, the most easily destructible part of the human body. In a word, it is the most impermanent. So compare that with the word who was in the beginning. The one who has life in himself. They could not be more different. They seem diametrically opposed, and yet John says they are joined in one person. It seems like a paradox. The word who is God does not cease to be God and when he becomes flesh. This is the mystery of Christ. This is the mystery of what we call the hypostatic union. That's just one of those big you know, $3 words that is talking about that theologians have come up, to, uh, come up with to refer to what is the joining of God and man in one person, in Jesus Christ. And we struggle with something like this, to come up with words that can adequately describe it, because it's just so amazing what's going on. John says that the word became flesh. And the, the word became is an important word as well. It's the same word that he used, that we translated create earlier, in the sense that the, the word created the universe. So he came to be flesh. He wasn't, prior, he wasn't flesh prior to that time. It's not, and he became flesh. It's not that he seemed to have flesh or that he seemed to be human. There are, there are uh, heresies that try to claim that. There's one called docetism. Uh, and also the Gnostics in the early centuries of the church said that he only seemed to be flesh. He only seemed to be human. He, he only appeared to have a body. It was just an apparition that only seemed solid. But that's not what the scripture says. He says he became Flesh, flesh meaning the entirety of the human nature. And as, even though he became flesh, he did not cease to be God. So he didn't stop being God, he became also human. He added a human nature to his divine nature in his one person. This is actually what Paul says in Philippians 2.7. seven. says, instead he emptied himself. Okay, emptied himself how? How did he do that? Well, he did it by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. He added a human nature to his divine nature. He did not remove any of his divinity. None of it. He didn't set aside anything of his godness. He just added humanness. I'm coining those words there, but he didn't lose anything of his divinity. In some way, Jesus Christ was and is both fully God and fully man at the same time. He is one person with two complete natures. One of them is divine and the other is human. And this is a mystery. We don't know exactly how that works. It's a mystery kind of like the Trinity. The Trinity is one God in three persons, one divine nature existing as three persons. Jesus Christ is one person existing as two natures. Each nature exists without changing the other. The divine does not become less divine. The human does not become more than human. They exist side by side in the one person. These are things that we struggle to figure out. Also, they're not mixed to become a third thing. That's some sort of hybrid creature between the two. These, we struggle to figure out how to make sense of this because this is not something that is natural to us, right? It, it's, it's, it's a God thing. And we have the, the church fathers to thank for really working out some of these issues in the first few centuries of the church. This is one of the main things that they thought about in those first 
several centuries. They struggled with these passages like what we're looking at today. And how do we reason this out? How do we even describe it? And um, it, how, do we, how do we put that into, and uh, distill that into words? And so some of them, like the Council of Nicaea, you've probably heard of in 325 AD, was one of the main ones that struggled with this. But this was, they then wrote it down as a Nicene, at what we call the Nicene Creed, which kind of encapsulates what they understood to be true from Scripture. It sort of distills out the scriptural teaching on it. The uh, Nicene Creed was then reaffirmed by the Council of Constantinople uh, a few years later, and the Nicene Creed puts it this way. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. That's the Nicene Creed. But they found out in, in the decades following that, that that still wasn't precise enough. There was, that still left the door open for certain other errors to, to come in, to other wrong ideas about Christ. So they ended up at, then count, convening another council in a city called Chalcedon in 451 A.D., to, to make things even more precise, to, to exclude these other errors about Christ that, that go against Scripture. And so you'll, the Chalcedonian Creed is much longer, but I'm going to give you an extract. It says this about Christ. It says, We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man of a rational soul and body, co-essential or of one essence with the Father according to the Godhead, co-essential or of one essence with us according to the manhood. In all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation born of the Virgin Mary, the bearer of God according to the manhood. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, the distinction of natures by no means being taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one substance not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten, God, the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can hear a lot of words in there, and the reason they're doing that is because it is so important what we understand about Jesus Christ. And we have to get it right, and we have to understand what the Scripture is saying. And we can be thankful that they did all this hard work of thinking and working through this, and we stand on their shoulders in this, but it's so important what we believe about Christ. From John's prologue, and as, as it's been distilled out into some of these early creeds, we understand that Jesus Christ is 100% God, and he is 100% man at the same time. And both of those are necessary for our redemption. If either one was not true, then we are not saved. That's how important this is. And in fact, another reason why John may have chosen to use this word flesh in here, that the word became flesh is because that calls to mind the idea of sacrifice. The, the, it's graphic, you know, with its elements of flesh and blood, and that's and Jesus Christ was our sacrifice. He was the the sacrifice of our redemption. The flesh of the sacrifice was none other than the Word who was God. And another implication besides this idea of sacrifice that's so important about who God is is that. The Son of God, God the Son, becoming flesh, means that God dwelt among us. Jesus Christ is our Emmanuel. When it says he dwelt among us, this is fascinating too, or made his dwelling among us, we could literally translate it as he pitched his tent among us. It's the same word that is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to refer to the tabernacle. John is wanting us to think about God living in the midst of his people during the Exodus. As God said about the tabernacle in Exodus 25, verse 8, he said, they are to make a sanctuary for me so that I may dwell among them. 
And so John is saying that was Exodus, that was the Old Testament, but now God will dwell among his people in a more personal way. You know, Moses would meet God in the tent of meeting, and he would hear God's word for the people. Now, people could meet God directly and hear his word from the flesh of Jesus Christ. In in the Old Testament, God's glory, or the Shekinah glory, rested on the tabernacle and represented his residence among his people. Now, God's glory was resident in the flesh of Jesus Christ. So while God had dwelt among his people and revealed his glory to his people in some fashion in the Old Testament, he had never dwelt among his people in such a personal way as he did now in the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation of God in Jesus Christ is unique and special. It is the most intimate and close connection between God and man. And actually, the uniqueness of the incarnation is further described as, as John goes on to describe the, the Son. It says that the John and the apostles, we saw the glory in Christ. Glory as the one and only Son from the Father. Now, that idea of glory is, especially in the old, coming from the Old Testament, as we brought, draw that idea of glory from the Old Testament, is God's majestic splendor, his, his power, like the way God showed in in, in the miracles that he did in Egypt and in the giving of the law with the, the, the cloud and the thunder and the fire on Mount Sinai. God's glory in the Old Testament is supposed to be kind of the visible manifestation of who God is, the whole nature of his being, and yet in a way that human beings could experience it without dying. That's kind of what his glory was, that visible manifestation. It was usually visible in a cloud or in a bright light, But John's saying now that glory is resident in a human being, in Jesus Christ. This special kind of glorious presence is here in the person of the unique Son of God. Now our Christian Standard Bible translates this as the one and only Son. Some of you might remember older translations that, that say the only begotten Son. The idea of that phrase is one of uniqueness. He is one of a kind. There is no other like him. God may have many children. as We saw in verse 12 that those who receive uh, Christ are given the right to become children of God. There may be many children, but Jesus Christ is the unique, one-of-a-kind Son of God. He is the Son of the Father. He is in a special relationship with God that none of us can have. He was with God. And now he is sent from God. So not only does he have a unique relationship with God, He is on a special and unique mission sent by God. This relationship and this mission are elements of the glory of this unique son. And his special glory is further described in that he is full of grace and truth. And John is wanting, again, for us to think back to Exodus, the passage we read earlier. It's almost certainly an allusion to that. Moses had asked God to show him his glory, and God said, I will cause my goodness to pass before you. So there's a sense in which God's goodness is his glory. And then God describes his goodness. As God passes by Moses, he gives this narration of what his goodness is. He says, he is abounding in faithful love and truth. And if you take those words and translate them into Greek and then translate them into English, it comes out as grace and truth. So the God who is full of faithful love and truth is Jesus Christ who is full of grace and truth. These were words also of God's faithful covenant with Israel. That covenant faithfulness that God had with Israel is now given its fullest expression in Jesus Christ. So John is saying that that glory that God showed to Moses is the same glory that is now in Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing that is. This is the unique and special incarnation of Christ. I mean, think about this. This is as significant an event as was the creation of the world in the first place. Because now we have the creator of the world entering into the world he created. This is just as significant as the creation in the first place. That's what John is trying to convey to us in this whole passage. God became flesh. 
He entered into a special union between God and mankind in one person. There's nothing like it. And so God came to live among his people, the son in a special way, who had been in a, in a special relationship with the father, now enters into a special relationship with humanity. And so he bridges the gap between God and man. He became God with us, God living among us, God living as one of us. And so the glory of God is now made visible to human beings in a way that we can experience without dying. Special thing. Now, and it's not, we, so we say that the glory is resident in Jesus Christ. We have to understand, though, it's not that everyone could see the glory. Jesus didn't walk around Galilee glowing. You know, not everyone could see it. But when he did signs and miracles, it revealed his glory. John says this later, and after he related the, the making of the water into wine in Cana, John 2.11 says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The signs revealed his glory. And those who had eyes to see could see it. Those who, the, who believed in it, they could see the glory. So now this is what John's talking about in this next little section. He talks about the witnesses of the glory of the incarnation. First, he speaks about himself and the other apostles in verse 14. We beheld his glory. The we he's talking about is primarily speaking of the disciples who walked around with Jesus for three years. He says that they observed his glory. Observed. There's more than one word in Greek that they could, could, could have used to talk about seeing. This one specifically means to see with the physical eye. Some people have tried to say that, well, how did they see his glory? They, they saw it in some mystical way with eyes of faith or they saw a vision. But there's different words for that kind of seeing. That's not the word that, J that John uses here. John and the apostles saw. They really saw the glory of God in Christ. It wasn't just eyes of faith. It wasn't just a vision. They saw the glory. They were eyewitnesses. John says later in his first letter, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, he says, What was from the beginning, that's a reference back to his gospel, by the way, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have observed, what we have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This we that he's talking about is the we of eyewitnesses. We saw, this is authoritative testimony. And by the way, he's not just talking about we saw the transfiguration, which he did. John was one of those who saw the transfiguration along with Peter when Jesus' divine glory was more fully unveiled. He actually did glow. He shone with light. John saw that with Peter. Peter wrote in 2 Peter, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He was talking about the transfiguration there. But the, John's not just talking about that here when he says we observed his glory. He said, we, they also saw the glory of God coming through Jesus in the signs that he did. We already talked about that with the making the wine, the water into wine. And also when he fed the 5,000, when he walked on water, when he raised Lazarus up from the grave. All of these displayed his glory. But they also saw the glory of God in Christ as he lived a perfect life. As the obedient, dependent son of the Father. Lived perfectly, without sin. He was the one who always did the will of his Father. He always sought out the glory of his Father. And ultimately, they saw the glory of the Son and how he submitted to the cross. Jesus said in his words to the disciples on the night before he was crucified, John 13, 31, he says, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and, the Father, and God is glorified in him. He was glorified by his sacrificial death in the place of wicked sinners like you and me. That also was his glory. So, the disciples were witnesses of the glory manifest in Jesus Christ during his earthly life. And John the Baptist was also a witness to the glory of the incarnation. It says, John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one of whom I said, the one coming after me ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. We're going to hear next week even just how much more John had to say about uh, Jesus Christ, but here 
this statement here, John's giving John the author is giving us a, a sort of planned parenthetical statement to, to give us a preview of John's testimony to emphasize the superiority of this unique son, to emphasize his glory, which John the Baptist had seen. And I think that the translation actually doesn't to- totally do justice to it in, in one area. The CSB says John testified, past tense, concerning him. But actually, in the, the, and it is true that he did testify in the past. That was a historical event in the past. But the Greek here is actually in the present tense. He testifies, present. He is currently testifying. His testimony stands and is still testifying to us. It's kind of like what it says in Hebrews 11 about Abel. It says that even though Abel is dead, he still speaks through his faith. In the same way, John's testimony stands. It still speaks to us. And think about what John the Baptist was saying that John, that John the author re- records for us. The one after me was actually, is actually before me. And for that reason, he surpasses me or he ranks higher than me. Think about that. According to Luke's gospel, John uh, the Baptist was born six months before Jesus, physically speaking. And all four gospels record John the Baptist's ministry, and they record that Jesus started his public ministry after John the Baptist. And so this is a society where age and precedence gave a person higher honor. And so some people might have thought, well, John the Baptist must then have higher honor than Jesus. But John here says, John the Baptist says, no. He is greater than me, even though he came after me. Why? Because he came before me. Because he existed before me. And so we see again the seeming paradox of of the incarnation, of the Son of God's entry into creation. Because although Jesus was after John, he was actually before him. Although Jesus was human, he was also God. And so he was and he is preeminent. His glory is over all. The glory of God had entered into creation in a profound way. And that brings us to our final point, the effects of the incarnation. I mean, you would expect that if God were to enter into his own creation, which he did, but it, that it would have profound effect, right? I mean, it's kind of like if you've ever thrown rocks into a pond. The bigger the rock, the bigger the splash, right? And the bigger the ripples more far-reaching its effects. Then we have the biggest rock of all coming into the pond of creation. It's going to have amazing effects. In this text, John mentions two effects, two impacts from the incarnation of Christ. The first one is in verses 16 and 17. Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace from his fullness. Because of God's grace, because of God's love, he sent his Son into the world For God so loved the world that he gave his only uh, begotten son. He sent his one and only son. And from the coming of the son, we have received grace. Now, the we here, we have received grace, refers to the apostles in the foreground. But standing behind them are all true believers. We all, all who believe in the name of Jesus, have received grace. And that grace is from his fullness. And John here is Picking up on the word in verse 14 where he said the son is full of grace and truth. From that fullness, we have received grace. And remember that, for, that phrase grace and truth points further back to the glory of God in Exodus 34. Moses had asked to see God's glory and God said, you can't see my face and live. But I will hide you in the crevice and put my hand over you and pass by and then you can see my back after I've passed. And of course, the notions of face and back here, by the way, are not literal and that God doesn't have a physical body. It's kind of um, ways of, of communicating to us that Moses could not endure the full blast of God's glory, but he could, he could receive, God had to kind of tone it down a little bit so that Moses wouldn't die. And as God passed by, we, we read earlier, he narrated his character. He has since described his own glory The Lord, the Lord is compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished. 
bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. And John's phrase, full of grace and truth, picks up on that phrase, abounding in faithful love and truth. So just as Yahweh God, who met Moses, is abounding in grace and truth, so also Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. Jesus is of the same nature as Yahweh God. In fact, he is Yahweh God, and it is from his fullness, from the fullness of who he is, that we have now received grace. And it's really interesting when John says that we have received grace upon grace. Really, the, the preposition that John uses there would be better to say grace instead of grace, or grace in place of grace. And you might, well, what, do you, what, is, what would he mean by grace in place of grace? It seems like a strange thing to say. But John explains what he means by it in verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's been an exchange of sorts. A new kind of grace has been given in place of the grace that was given before. The law came through Moses. This is what was going on in Exodus when Moses asked to see God's glory, when he saw it on Mount Sinai. And the law was a gift of God's grace. I know, I know Paul speaks of the law in somewhat negative terms at times, and it did have limitations, but it was still given to Israel as a grace to them. Because think about it, I mean, it was what enabled God to live in their midst, because then they, they would be a holy people. But notice that the law was given through Moses, it was not given by Moses, it was a gift of grace from God through Moses to Israel. It was a good thing. It taught them about who God was, what God was like, taught, taught, taught them about his character. It made it possible for God to live in their midst without destroying them. The law was also a covenant relationship between God and Israel. And through that covenant, God promised to care for Israel, to, to bless them in response to their obedience. But then there's this implied comparison. As good as it, the law was, it was now replaced by another gift of grace which is the grace and truth embodied in Jesus Christ. And John now finally here in verse 17 uses the name that we're all so familiar with, Jesus Christ. This is the first time he's used it. And what he's doing is bringing all the threads of the prologue and he's connecting them all down to this person, Jesus Christ. Because they, uh, the people he's writing to had heard the name Jesus Christ. He's saying, let me kind of give you some background threads that all come coalesce into this one person, the Word, the life, the light, the one and only Son, all of those are Jesus Christ. Now through Moses, notice, the law was given, but through Jesus Christ, grace and truth came. The law was given, Christ came. God gave to his people through Moses, but God came to his people through Jesus Christ. In the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, God revealed himself to Moses. But Moses could not see the fullness of God's glory. And the, the law that was given through Moses was just a dim reflection of God's glory. But was, what Moses was not able to see, Jesus Christ is in himself. Jesus is the grace of, and truth of God embodied in a person. He is the new and personal manifestation of the fullness of God's glory. And so while the old covenant was a gracious covenant, allowing for the relationship between God and Israel, the new covenant in Christ gives us new hearts. It gives us a new spirit. It begins the new creation in us so that we are prepared to live in the unfiltered presence of God, able to experience the fullness of his glory. By the way, this is actually the last occurrence of the word grace in John's gospel. He doesn't use the word again in the rest of his gospel. And the, the, the reason that's been proposed for that is that for John, grace is embodied in Jesus Christ. If he just speaks of Jesus Christ. He is speaking of grace. It, grace has no meaning outside of Christ. And so in the incarnation, we are truly granted grace, the grace of of redemption in Jesus Christ, the grace of God's presence. But another effect is given in, of the incarnation is given in verse 18. 
No one has ever seen God. The one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. This is the historic relationship between God and man encapsulated in one sentence. No one has ever seen God. No, God cannot be seen. I mean, not even Moses really saw God. He saw maybe an outline. Maybe some people called it an afterglow of his glory. And when the, the Old Testament sometimes does talk about someone seeing God, like when the elders of Israel went up on the mountain with Moses in Exodus 24, but they did not see God's essential being. Any seeing of God was just shadows and figures, not his true being. I mean, God told Moses, you cannot see my face and live. You can only see my back. And then there's the, the, the time when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. But what he saw was like, best I can describe, is probably like what an ant would see if it was sitting in front of you as you're sitting on a chair. See, it's just kind of your knees, you know. And with Isaiah, he saw just the, 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 the robe filling the temple. And even seeing, just seeing that, Isaiah was undone. He says, woe is me, I am ruined. The one exception, the one person who can see God is the one who was with God in the beginning. The text calls him once again the unique son, the one and only son, the one who is himself God. Now, I'll, I'll just acknowledge that the grammar of this sentence is challenging, and many people try to, to argue against certain things, but the best way to make sense of it is that this, it is saying that the Son is himself God. And so this is actually returning to what is, was said in verse 1. It's like this envelope structure, beginning and the end of the, of the passage. In, the, in verse 1, the word was God. The unique Son is God in this verse. And it also repeats the idea of the word being with God. And in the ver verse 1, it says he was with God. In this one, it says he is uh, at the Father's side. Literally translated, it would be in the Father's bosom. So the unique son that's talking about here in verse 18 is God. And he is with God, God the Father, in a close personal relationship. This one, this God-man, Jesus Christ, he is the one who has seen God. He is the only one who has seen God, and since he is God, he can see God and live. But God, Jesus Christ doesn't just see God, he actually also shows us God. That's what this verse is talking about. This is the other effect of the incarnation. God's, John says, he has revealed him. Literally translated, it says, he has exegeted him. Some of you will recognize that word, exegete. The exegete means to describe or to explain. It's a word we use to refer to the process of studying Scripture, to understand what it means, and then to explain that to other people. And Jesus Christ, John says, explains, he exegetes, he describes God to us. He reveals God to us. In Jesus Christ, we see God. John 14, right, this is right before Jesus' crucifixion, the disciple Philip said, that's kind of a question, kind of like what Moses asked. Lord, show me your glory. But Philip asked to see God. He said, Lord, said Philip, show us the Father, and that is enough for us. Very similar question to Moses, isn't it? Let's see God. And Jesus said to him, have I been among you all this time, and you do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who lives in me does his works. See Jesus is to see God. Now, through this, all the rest of this gospel, the, the whole rest of the gospel of John, John is going to be fleshing out, pun intended, what it means for Jesus Christ to reveal the Father. All the rest of this is going to be Jesus Christ revealing God. As Jesus speaks, and as he interacts with people, as he does miraculous signs, he will be revealing God. And Jesus reveals the character of God in a flesh and blood sort of way. Not only that, he reveals the plan of God just by the fact that he came. He reveals God's plan to redeem a lost world through all the steps he takes to the cross and beyond. And there's so much more we could say about these verses. As you can tell, they are just packed with, with meaning. 
They communicate to us such profound, such universe-shaping truths. So what you need to understand about this is that the application of this passage is not so much something that you need to do now, it's something that you need to believe. Because this is foundational. Remember, believing comes before doing. And the, the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of God in the flesh, needs to shape your worldview at the deepest level, foundational level. Because everything else then flows from that. If we think about that our greatest purpose in life is to worship God, right? Our greatest purpose is to worship God. We need to re- worship God as he has revealed himself to be. Otherwise, we're worshiping a false God. If your idea of God is just formed from various thoughts you have in your own mind, then that's a false God. We have to re- worship God as he has told us he is. And so if you're going to love and worship Jesus Christ, you must love and worship him as he has said that he is. And I know some of these truths, as we think about them, are, are hard to think about. They, they, they kind of hurt our brains. It's hard to wrap our minds around them. Nevertheless, as we learn those things and as we seek to understand them, it should overflow in even more exuberant worship. Because as we start to understand how special and how unique Jesus Christ is as both fully God and fully man and what he came to do, we recognize that he is worthy of worship. As Thomas finally realized when he said, my Lord and my God. And we see how great his love is that he would enter into our situation, into our world, to present himself to us in this way. Just to see how he embodies in his one person the relationship between God and man. How we can have this covenant relationship with God. We, we overflow with love for him. And when we recognize that he is God. We understand that we must obey him. We must follow him. This should affect every aspect of our lives every decision every action needs to be taken with the lordship of christ in mind so that whatever we do in word or deed would all be for his glory he alone is worthy amen let's pray our heavenly father what glorious truths you have shown to us today Truths that we struggle to understand, but we, we even struggle to describe, but such glorious things, that you would enter into your creation, that you would bring about restoration in the relationship between God and man in this way, that it just blows our mind, or that you could be, Jesus Christ could be God and man in one person. But we don't fully understand it, but we see it in your word. And having seen it, we believe it. Lord, this causes us to worship you because you are great, mighty. You are full of loving kindness and truth. And you are our only hope in life and death. Thank you for that. Pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.